Hello and welcome to the Being Human podcast. I am Dr. Greg Bataro, and I'd like to talk with you today about dreams, a little bit related to a recent episode we did on the imagination, but we want to go further with this because we can we can use our imagination and step outside the box. Um, we talked about sort of being in time and space, and then the imagination is this bridge, this gateway that takes us out of where we are in time and space, but how can we use that even further, even deeper to, to become even more in line with who God created us to be? And I think that dreaming is a big part of that. Having a goal, having an understanding of what we're shooting for. We talk about discernment. We talk about knowing God's will. And, and there's a lot of times this focus and emphasis on sort of like just kind of like receiving the marching orders, like just tell us what to do and we're going to do it. But we lose a big sense of the collaboration that God has invited us into with him in understanding and discovering our will when we don't really think about what our hearts desire. So for this episode, we're going to open this up. And actually, I'm really uh, excited and happy to be bringing back to the show Amy Grace, who has joined us in the past, and uh, we're going to be talking a bit about what it means to dream and how we can tap into that faculty that God gave us and maybe even practice and get a little bit better at it. So when we come back here, Amy Grace will be joining me and uh, look forward to diving into this. My name is Dr. Greg Bataro, and I want to welcome you to the Being Human podcast. All right, Amy Grace, welcome back. Here we are. Hello. Hello. I'm excited to be back. <laughs> yes, this is awesome. We got such great feedback the last time when you and I had a little coffee chat for the podcast. And so really looking forward to uh, doing this more frequently. We did. I think I think about like probably 10 of the views that we got from that podcast or my mom. <laughs> 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 nice. Well, thank you. That's great. Mrs. Miller, we love you. We appreciate you. <laughs> keep, keep, keep racking up those views for us. <laughs> exactly. We're climbing the charts because of my mom. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so what are we going to talk about today? We're, we're, we're opening up this idea of dreams and you've kind of, you, you were, you were sort of, uh, instigating a bit of this conversation before. So, so tell us where you're coming from and what you're thinking about in terms of what we're going to open up here. Yeah. So I know that I'm here for the community, like to be the voice of the community. Um, <clears throat> in this episode, I do have to say I am being a little bit selfish and I'm hoping that the community <laughs> <laughs> um, agrees with, with my voice now. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, because I just, I, you know, as I mentioned in conversations with different people uh, recently, it seems like the topic of just dreaming, like dreaming has been coming up. Like, how do you, how do you have dreams about the future? How do you maybe make a plan for how you're going to, you know, get those dreams once you know what your dreams are? And I think it, it tied in a lot to the um, episode about imagination that's something that we don't use as much as adults. And I think the same thing goes for, for dreaming. It's just like, when you get to be an adult, I feel like there's a part of you that just kind of shuts down and you're like, I just have to do as much adulting as I can. And that does not include dreaming. <laughs> yeah. So I just, um, I know in the past you have talked a little bit about your excitement about dreaming. Um, you seem to do it really well. Uh, and I know you had mentioned your experience with dreaming about going to Italy and then having that come to fruition. So I just really want to break it open and just ask you, like, how do you dream? Yeah, definitely. Just to fill people in. Uh, I think I forget if I was talking about it in a course or a video from from the past, but I had um, always had a dream from when I was in college, uh, when I, I had taken a trip to Italy and then when I was there, I was, I forget exactly which cathedral I was in, but just one of these old, ancient, beautiful churches and praying. And I just had the sense of um, wanting to be back here 
if I, and I had no idea what my vocation was at that point, but if I was going to be married and have a family that I'd want to um, bring my family back mm-hmm. and, and sort mm-hmm. of be in this space And there was something like really deep about that moment. It wasn't just a fanciful idea, but it was sort of like kind of resonated at the depths of my soul in a way that it made a mark. And, um, I, I, you know, long story short, after, after years of, um, of finding my vocation, getting married, having a few kids, and that was still always coming back to me. And I had no idea how that was going to happen, but I felt like it was so important that I, I got this large photograph framed of uh, Santa Lucia in Sicily in the hometown where my family actually comes from. And so I had that put above my desk my, in my office. And so every day I was staring <laughs> up at Santa Lucia and that was just like in the room. And I did nothing more than that. It's just to put it up on the wall. And then that was sort of like, nurturing and and tapping into this this desire that I had and lo and behold little by little pieces started to come together and I realized I actually think we're going to be able to do this and so um, I reorganized some work things and I reorganized some house things and uh, next thing you know we had rented an Airbnb this old very old apartment uh, the plumbing that didn't really work and lots of interesting things, but we, we rented it for, um, I think it was two months that first, that first stint. And so we're just like, let's go live in Italy. Why not? Wow. And we just figured it out, made it work. And, um, you know, we had, I believe four kids at the time. And, uh, and so we were just like four kids under five. We were the crazy American family living in Sicily. (laughs) And it was great because we lived in, um, and Syracuse is a, a port town and there's a lot of, um, uh, cruise ships that come through. And oh. so all these tourists would come off the boat. And then I just remember like sitting in this little breakfast cafe with our kids around us at the table and they start taking pictures of us. <laughs> we're like, is this like a famous cafe or and then like the Italians were like talking to them and then there's like more people taking pictures and I was just like what is going on here and the next thing you know uh, we're like a spectacle and they're like oh they're just like they they've never seen so many children before and I'm are you like, serious what the heck? <laughs> so it's it's totally crazy like uh, you know just these little snapshots of these memories that 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 were happening there but you know, we had like moments after moments like that with just like experiencing different cultures and experiencing like giving our kids different experiences, half of which they're never going to remember, but <laughs> the stories live on. And so it's a beautiful thing that happened there. Hmm. And I think it was really important to, first of all, know what it was to feel that dream. And then number two, to like put ourselves into a place that we could make that happen. And, and, um, you know, not lose sight of it. So, yeah, I think, I think there is a big deficit in, in where people don't know how to dream. They don't even know what that looks like. And I ask all of our employees, uh, at anybody that works for Catholic psych, I'll ask, what are, what are your dreams? Mm-hmm. And so I want to turn the table on you for a moment and turn this <laughs> back to you, because the first time I asked you that. Like share with us what your, what your feelings were, what your thoughts were like, what did that mean for you? Like what stirred up in you when, um, when I asked you that question? Yeah, well, that's sort of what spurred this, uh, discussion on the podcast because I, I actually got really upset with myself after you asked me that because my mind went absolutely blank. And normally I can, I'll have some feeling or some movement or, you know, like something, I'll have something in my mind. And there was absolutely nothing. And after we finished that, that conversation, I, I was just like, I just kept thinking about it and journaling about it. And like, 
why don't I know, like, what is it in me that I've just completely shut down so that, you know, to like result in the fact that I don't know what, I don't have anything to say (laughs) when someone asks me, what are your dreams? What would you like, where would you like to be in five years? What would you like to be doing? So I think I started just like thinking a lot about the idea of dreaming and like setting goals. And I think one thing that um, is really scary to me is there's so many options and it's like, how do you decide? Like, I'm kind of like St. Therese and like, I just want it all. Like, yeah, I, I just want it all. And yeah, so, it's hard to choose. yeah, if you can't have it all, like, how do you decide, how do you narrow it down to what really is your dream? That's interesting because that's really a shift that's happened in culture, I think, in our society where like our parents' generation and, and generations past, you know, there's so many limitations based on mm. location, where you live, the schools, the programs, the sort of job trajectories, you know, all these kinds of things that just to get out of what you're restricted to be in is already a, a beginning of dreaming, mm. you know, just like escaping, you know, getting out of this town getting Mm -hmm. out of this, you know, job or, you know, there's like these things, but now we have almost no limitations. Right. We're, we're already taught from the earliest age. Like you can go anywhere, you can do anything like virtual stuff, whatever you want to be, you can be whatever you want to be. (laughs) It's interesting because it it really is that like the, the decision paralysis where you have Mm -hmm. so many options then you're like, okay, I don't even know which one to choose now. Right. Right. But my, you know, my sort of take on it going off of the imagination podcast is that there's, these are brain patterns and these are like neurological patterns of activity to use different aspects of our capacities, our faculties that we have. So it actually, there are certain brain circuits involved in using the imagination. And there's other brain circuits like very related to, to those with dreaming. Like when we actually step outside of ourselves. but with all things neurological, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's like the, that's the way they said, they talk about neurology, the circuits that fire together, wire together. You know, they have all these like little things that they, (laughs) to remember the way the brain works. That's what I remember anyways, from from grad school. If we keep on firing the same pattern of thought or same operational sort of uh, dynamics, Mm -hmm. just sitting down to dream big, it's like an exercise of a muscle. You're like starting to exercise a muscle that in the beginning, if you haven't used that muscle in a long time, it's going to be pretty pathetic. Interesting. But then you go back again and you repeat and you go back to the gym and you start the exercise over again. And next thing you know, you're three months in and now you're, you know, doing so much more than you ever thought possible. Wow. Okay. So, so we've got to start little somewhere. Yeah. You have to start somewhere and then you start to think about like, how does the imagination come into play? How do I start dreaming about what I can do? And even if you're not used to it, even if maybe you're, you have so many choices that it paralyzes your, that, that, that functioning of your brain where you're not even going to try to use it anymore. You have to start somewhere to just get those gears back, you know, oil, the gears, the old rusty gears that are creaking away to kind of get started. And I I was actually just talking to somebody about this. One one of my clients actually today, um, and was saying, you know, this is an iterative process Mm -hmm. to dream. And if we sit down and say like, okay, what are your dreams in five years? Like if you've never thought about that before, (laughs) what you put down on the paper for today is only going to be starting that gear grinding, you know, creaky gear Mm. process, but come back to it tomorrow. Because what happens is if you, if you just ask yourself that question, write down a paragraph on a piece of paper and then let it sit, just let it marinate. And unconsciously 
in your psyche, that's just going to sit there and it's going to start to stir up some things. And Mm -hmm. if you come back again tomorrow, it's going to be a little easier to think through those thoughts and new things might come up. Hmm. And then if you come back to it again in three days or five days or a week from now, and this is an iterative process. So you try over and over again, and you have this developmental picture that starts to formulate over time. Gotcha. I, I remember when you first used the word iterative with me and I made a mental note, I was like, I need to look up the word iterative. (laughs) (laughs) And then I feel like you've kind of like adopted the word. And so now I use it a lot, a lot. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm really glad that I know what the word iterative means now. Um, Because in, in my mind, like I've started using it in my own life. Like, That's oh, great. the, you know, my daily, um, like my daily schedule, it's an iterative process. Like you, you do it and you come back and you assess what worked and what didn't and what needs adjusting. And then you adjust and you try it again. And so you keep coming back. And so the iterative, like, just keep coming back to it. So you're saying like, start those creaky gears by oiling the chain of the bike, like letting it marinate and sit and then just trying the pedals a little bit. Exactly. And that looks like, practically speaking, um, would you say just like journaling about your desire? Sure, you could journal. I mean, people have different ways of operating, like of of tapping into their creative juices. This is a bit of a creative process. Obviously, mindfulness comes into play here, (laughs) being in the present moment, not having your fight or flight system. Like that's the thing. Mm. The, the normal anxiety that most people live in every day, like if you're in fight or flight, you don't care about what your life looks like five years from now. You're trying to make sure you live for, through the day. Yeah. So those brain patterns that operate with the sympathetic nervous response in that fight or flight system are totally counteracting the creativity that's necessary for imagination, for stepping outside of this time and place. Like if there's a threat to your life in this time and place, you're not stepping away from it. You're (laughs) totally zeroed in on it. Right. But if we can like, remember that actually all is well, we can trust in God's providence. Everything is going to be okay. Jesus makes all things well. Like we have nothing to worry about. Then you can step outside of this time and place. We can use those imaginative and creative juices, get those brain neural pathways firing. And then, and then we can sit down. Now, some people might journal. Some people just have a conversation. Some people just want to communicate and have a, you know, a, a, a communicate, a, a dialogue about it with somebody. Some people might be want to paint a picture. Uh, you know, some people, I, it really doesn't matter how you get it out. But the point is you're, you're activating those neural pathways in your brain and you're thinking about these things. And then, you know, besides the brain part of it, it's like open up the Holy Spirit. And, mm. and just say like, all right, God, like help me. And it's not just like, God, tell me what to do. Right. It's I, God, help me understand myself. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because what I was going to say related to that, I think that part of it is as an adult, you just don't utilize these functions as much. I think another part of it is that growing up, you know, Catholic and, and for so long, I heard like, you just, you have to, you know, you want to do God's will. Like you have to do God's will. If you do God's will, it's just like, okay, well it's God's will must be this thing outside of me that I need to figure out. Right. And so it's just like, I hope I'm doing God's will. And so it really didn't, I never thought of God's will as being my desires as part of me so right. there's very much this disintegrated um way of thinking about god's will so i do think that dreaming has a lot to do with reintegrating those those like parts of of what well, god's will might be what's on your heart <laughs> right and, and it is what's on your it can't be anything else like at the end of the <laughs> I'm day not ready to say it is i'm ready to say it might be you know yeah no no we're all we're all in on the integration here this is it like you're you're absolutely right it's the perfect word because it's exactly what happens and we and we have to recognize that it's not even like an option it's not a maybe it's not mm. and it's also not like well in some spiritual traditions maybe this is how you discern hmm. 
if you're human, you're made in God's image. Mm -hmm. If you're made in God's image, you have a capacity for truth, goodness, and beauty, and a capacity for relationship with Christ through your baptism this a capacity i'm saying the capacity is there to know god and then if we're baptized then we're actually initiated into the body of christ and then by grace we have this dynamic relationship that's actualized so it's the capacity that we have that's then actualized to discover god's will and it, but it's going to come from within because of that capacity that we have because that's who he made us to be in our humanity say that again we have a dynamic capacity to actualize so <laughs> <laughs> so the capacity it means like we're made to be in relationship okay mm -hmm. he gave us all the all the sort of faculties that we need he gave us like all the bells and whistles that we need in our humanity to be in relationship with him now that doesn't mean that automatically we're in relationship with him Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a capacity. It doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's uh, definitively happening for every single human person. But every single human person does have the stuff. It's like a car has all the things you need to drive. It needs gas to be added to make those gears work and to make that engine turn over and actually to start the car and to keep it going. But every car has an engine. By definition, this is what makes a car a car. So, so to be in relationship with God is by definition built into our actual humanity. It, we need grace. We need baptism. We need to like fully enter into the life of union with God through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But that's what it means to be human. We're made in his image. So grace is sort of like the gasoline. It's just gonna. Yeah. Kind of, it, yeah. It, analogously <laughs> in, the, in the picture. Yes. That's how. Yes. That's what gotcha. it would be. And it's a, specifically the sacramental grace that comes through baptism and, and that change in our, in our identity at that level mm -hmm. because of that grace. And from there, we will come to know. Yeah. So from there, it's in the relationship that it's, it's uh, we are formed and informed and conformed and transformed Mm -hmm. And this means that like the very stuff that we are is becoming transformed. So again, it's not mm -hmm. like a rock that you're just putting like a really pretty cover over. And then you're like, oh, this is a saint cover <laughs> that's going over this like thing. That's just this object. Like it's our very self that's mm -hmm. becoming the saint. And th so, so therefore it's like, we have to look within ourselves as the thing that's made to be in relationship with God, to be transformed into Jesus Christ, that we discover what that path literally should look like. And it mm -hmm. comes down to like, what do I do with my life this day, this month, this year? What do I do? It could be big questions vocationally. It could be small questions like what kind of car to get? <laughs> like it could, it could be really anything. But it's, it's always looking within to discover what the desires are in, in the depths of our own hearts. So it's important to know how to look within. And it's also important then to, to be aware of what's like me and what's maybe not really me. What do you mean? I think like, like I'm thinking about just all of the different wounds and stories and, you know, like narratives we have that we tell ourselves about ourselves. But, so, and I think, I think this is another place of, of paralysis because if we're too afraid of like, what's quote unquote, not really me, well, actually it is you, but it's mm -hmm. the iterative you. <laughs> <laughs> It's the work in progress, you, which is totally lovable and acceptable by God. It's like you are who you are today, including the wounds, including hmm. the, you know, all the things you've been through, the mistakes and including the missteps you're going to continue to make. So this is something I talk about in my own vocational discernment. You know, when I, when I was, when I decided to join the Franciscans and become a friar, 
like I was seeking in the depths of my heart, like what is my deepest desire? It was like, I finally, after five years, discovered like I really actually in the depths of my heart want to be a Franciscan friar. I want to be celibate. I want to be a priest specifically in the tradition of St. Francis. And I joined the CFR friars and I was all in 1000%. I've told this story before. I gave away everything way too soon. <laughs> I showed up at the friary and all the postulants there are like talking about how they still have their bank accounts and stuff. I'm like, I don't have a bank account anymore. <laughs> you guys didn't about? close your bank accounts. They're like, uh, didn't you read the paperwork? <laughs> You're not supposed to close your bank account for like two years. So I didn't have clothes. I gave away my car, like everything. I had nothing. I was excited and I was really happy because I had discovered mm -hmm. what was in the depth of my heart. But then over that course of those two and a half, three and a half years, because of the prayer, because of the discernment, because of the healing, because of spending hours upon hours with Father Benedict Rochelle and his mentorship and the way that he led me and taught me how to pray more and spend more time, five hours a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Real healing happened inside my heart. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. So my vision, my, my imagery was that I, I could see inside my heart, like looking down into a cave and I felt like I saw the treasure chest it was like at the, on the floor of the cave and that treasure chest contained my vocation. Like that's the, the bottom quote unquote of my heart and the depths of my heart. And that, in that treasure chest was this vocation to celibacy. And as time went on and I healed all of a sudden little cracks started to form in the cave floor. And as cracks formed and spaces opened up, all of a sudden light started shining up through the cracks. And the more I spent in prayer and the more that I healed and worked through some stuff from my past, all of a sudden the floor started to crumble. And at some point it completely fell through and fell out and the treasure chest went crashing through. And all of a sudden this deeper cavern opened up with, with tremendous light oh. shining up. So instead of looking down into a dark cave, it was like this glorious light that was shining up from the true depths of my actual heart. And as I looked down into there, I saw another gift, which was my true vocation. And I saw that there in the actual depths of my heart was a vocation to marriage. Hmm. And that's when I knew I had to leave the friars and, and I'm using imagery, but I felt it like it was a desire. Right. I wasn't, there was, there were moments along the way when I thought like the, the end, the last year was really hard for me as a friar. So it became like really difficult to live the life, like internally and emotionally. It was some days I felt actually pretty unhappy, pretty miserable. Mm -hmm. And I remember some days to just be really sort of, you know, transparent. I remember some days putting on that habit in tears mm. and just like, how am I supposed to live this life of I'm supposed to be a, a witness of joy, <laughs> like proclaiming the gospel. Really like gross. God is so good <laughs> that we could give it all for him. <laughs> I'm in tears. Like crying. I'm feeling so miserable <laughs> putting in. And like, I share that story with friars with some of the brothers sometimes. And they're like, well, I've definitely had moments where I feel like that. Yeah. But it's like, it's okay to feel like that in for moments in your vocation. It's not mm. okay when that's growing and growing and growing and growing mm. when you're in a phase of discernment and it actually is appropriate to be discerning. And then it's like a year later and it's still like, you know, and it's been tested by spiritual direction and everything else. So anyways, point being, I knew even mm. in those moments, I, I am not going to be okay leaving because it's too hard or I'm too miserable. That's not going to be a reason for me to, leave like I might need to lock myself up in my cell <laughs> and nobody see me but I'm not going to feel free to leave if that's what's happening and, and that was the prayer continual prayer and discernment and in healing and working through and at the end of the day it was like stuff for my parents divorce stuff from family life growing up and like stuff about my identity and stuff about marriage in general and like all these things mm -hmm. but i literally changed and that floor opened up and the deepest desire came out and i was like i am so happy i want to be married 
Mm. I want to be married. Mm. I love these brothers. I love this life. I hope I spend the rest of my life near these people. Like, Mm. and I am, thank God, like praise God to this day. Like it's amazing. But like I, for myself really just feel totally called to be married Mm. because it's in the depths of my desire. And I knew that was God speaking to me. And I knew that was the collaboration of how much he loved me. He put that in my heart because he wanted me to do that. And instead of it being like, God, just tell me what you want me to do. He was like, I'm telling you, <laughs> look inside your heart. What do you desire? I'm trying to tell you. Your desires are me telling you. Hmm. So it's it's not an either or. It's a both and. Hmm. That's what discernment is. And so it's not wrong that I joined the friars. Mm -hmm. That was his will for me. And he did want me there. And he did put that desire in my heart at that point. And I can't imagine finding my way to where I am today if I hadn't gone a different way. But yeah, it was his will in my desire that brought me there. Hmm. It's really interesting because it's like looking back you could look at it and say like, oh, it was totally wrong. I was mistaken. Like I made the mistake of joining the friars. I, you know, like, but that was part of the process. It had to be right that you had to do that. And so in listening to the desire, even though it, it didn't end the way maybe that you thought it was when you were entering, like you had to go through that in order to get to your true vocation and to your, to something that is really, um, you know, fulfilling you on an, an even deeper, it's almost like you had to go through the desire of uh, the Franciscans to get right. to the desire of marriage, you know? Right. So that's really interesting. Like you have to go looking for that treasure chest in order for the floor to, to be exactly. broken up to get to where you need to go. And obviously like I start, I start breaking some of these things open and people get into their analytical mind. And and we all have, we all have reservations about the way we think about things. And especially when it comes to this level of understanding of collaboration, how much God loves us, it's almost too good to be true. And it triggers a lot from people of, of distrust of themselves. People recognize how many mistakes they've made. People recognize how many wounds are suffered because of other people's mistakes, following, quote unquote, following their heart and all this stuff. So I recognize all that. And I understand, like, with compassion, all of those parts that are reacting in that way are understandable. However, at the same time, you know, the all we can do is give it our best effort to follow our conscience And, and to, of course we have to have well-formed conscience. We'd need to seek truth. Like, I'm not sitting here going like, well, you know, I was really thinking that I desire to be a, you know, international espionage, uh, (laughs) you know, secret. I I just want to go like steal from foreign governments and become like a spy. (laughs) Like, okay, clearly. Your true desire is to be a hitman. (laughs) I I really have a true desire to be a hitman. Like, obviously there's some level of saying like, we have good intention. We're mm-hmm. sort of, if anybody's even asking the question, like, how do I know what God is calling me to? <laughs> like, we're re- presupposing that you want to know what God is calling you to, that you have some mm-hmm. disposition of heart that is saying like, I care what God thinks. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't think if I'm looking to be a hit international hit man, <laughs> God cares what I think at that point, unless, you know, whatever. But the point is, <laughs> then we go with what we have. So then mm-hmm. back to your point, it's like all the junk is there. Like there are these misdirections. There are these wounds. There are these lies that we've been told. There are these mistakes that we've made and have suffered the consequences of even in our own life. And that's all part of the story. Mm-hmm. And that's how much God loves us is that he works within our story to bring us to him. Like that's the whole point of the incarnation. He became one of us so that he can meet us where we are, even though where we are, where we were was completely infinitely separated from him. So he went even there to grab us, 
to take us back to becoming like him. So of course he's going to meet us where we are now <laughs> in our baptized, God fearing, God seeking selves mm -hmm. and bring us to where he is. It is, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to believe. I think again, it goes back to the point of like, really truly knowing God loves you is, is like the key to all of it. Like really being grounded in that love because like what you just said, it's, it's almost like if you haven't fully received, and I mean, I'm talking about myself, like struggling to really fully receive the love of God and be grounded and know that that he loves you beyond any of your faults or failings or, you know, uh, missteps or, you know, whatever. Um, and that he will use everything for your good. Like, that's right. That sounds too good to be true. If, if, you know, you haven't really sat with that and really right. let it, let it like soak in. It should sound too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the point. It's like, if you're, if you're thinking about the right thing, it should sound too good to be true. Mm -hmm. If you're, if it doesn't sound too good to be true, you're probably not actually thinking about the right thing. True. And then you have to accept it. Like it can be too good to be true. That means mm -hmm. that like, I'm not in control. Somebody else decided I deserve to be loved and is loving me in a way that I can't actually make sense of. Hmm. now you're on the right track right yeah well i've got some praying to do now but <laughs> <laughs> what i would like though <laughs> is some practical tips yeah so i or think just going back to, to the dreaming. yeah let's go back to our iterative <laughs> process here of growth and transformation i i do think that it's it's a really good thing to just think about what you want your life to look like five years from now if you think about five years from now so it's going to be 2026 if it's 2021 right now when we're recording this and you know think about how old you're going to be think about how old if you're married how many years married you are if you have kids how old your kids are like we, we actually just got a dog and we're, uh, I was watching a training thing for the dog. And the guy was like, he was like, you know, this is going to be a really intense year of training, but your dog will be formed in a year. And he's like, just imagine you have like 12 or 14 years, hopefully with this dog as your companion in your life. And all of a sudden my wife and I looked at each other, we're like, this is a long-term commitment for this dog. <laughs> <laughs> I forget like raising kids or being married itself, <laughs> but just having a dog like 12, like, wow, we're going to have a dog 10 years from now, 12 years from now. Like, it's hard to get into that mindset, yeah. but we, if we practice and we try it out and we can, we can actually bring that up and like use the imagination mm -hmm. and step into that place where we're stepping out of this place and, and try it on for size and then think about what you come up with, but then come back to it. Hmm. It's not about having all the right answers. It's not like you have to figure it out right now. It's, it's about going to that, you know, it's like that mental exercise of just lifting a little bit of weight and getting those neural pathways fired up and then coming back again and then try it again in a couple of days. So what I tell people is put it, put it on your calendar set a reminder for yourself, mm -hmm. check in with yourself. So do it as soon as you can check in with yourself three days later, check in with yourself another three days after that. And let this be a part of your own, like consider this discernment. This is actually discernment. Mm -hmm. This isn't just like a foofy exercise where like, you know, listening to something from like Oprah and it's all about like dreaming big. It's like, no, no, no. This is like what God expects of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another retreat that just talks about like how we can interpret saint Teresa of avila is not going to be the whole story it's part of the story it's not the whole mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. because saint Teresa of avila actually sat there thinking what is in the depths of my heart mm -hmm. and that's how saint Teresa of avila wrote the story about how to become saint Teresa of avila 
it was a collaboration. It was a love story between her and God. And a part of that was her looking in herself and saying, what do I desire? So every single one of us needs to do the same thing and think about what we're dreaming about. Hmm. All right. Got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It's a good reminder. And it's an ongoing process. It's always <laughs> iterative. <laughs> And on that note, we better end this before I use that word again. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us and listening. I pray that this has blessed you. And as always, we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, God bless you. Thanks for listening to the Being Human podcast. If you want more free content and information about what we do at the Catholic Psych Institute, head on over to catholicpsych.com. God bless you. God bless you.